horse can get sick from, I mean, they, they do what they call colic. They can get that from eating while they're uh, overheated. They can get it from eating too much hay without drinking water. They can get it from not drinking enough water just itself. They can get it if they're stressed out. So, I mean, you just have to kind of, what is it? Like an ounce of prevention. An ounce of prevention is worth like a pound of cure or something like that. It's, it's true with these guys. And then the pink stuff I've been giving them is electrolytes. We give that to them in the morning and at night and it makes them drink water during the day. And in the afternoon, again, so they're less likely to hydrate. Our busy days are the days that we are in the cemetery. And those are the days where soldiers are gonna start out. Uh, they'll be here at the barn at four o'clock in the morning uh, doing TAC. Uh, TAC refers to the saddles, all the leather, everything that is actually placed on the horse for the, uh, for the funeral. Everything we do in the morning, as far as shining it is what will be done for the day and when they get back at night they actually go through and thoroughly clean the leather and there's certain days where they'll put like leather food and leather dye on to help bring the color back and keep the leather healthy but during the day it's pretty much just trying to maintain it as opposed to clean it every, every after every mission it was actually uh, designed I believe kind of after the English saddle, but specifically to help the horse. I, the idea behind it was that even though it's uncomfortable for the soldier, it's good for the horse. Since a good horse is hard to find, but soldiers are easy to come by. Uh, we should get six in there uh, for. Normally we put seven, but we don't have all the loops. In the start of a normal day, you would actually have to wash horses. You know, they're just like us. You know, they don't want to be woken up so so early in the morning. So you know, they're still kind of groggy. They're a little grumpy at times. So you know, you have to have to deal with, and you have to actually make sure their hooves are set and that their shoes are on tight. Because if they actually manage to throw a shoe during cemetery, you know, it can wear down the hoof a lot, and we can't have that. We generally polish all the brass on the wagon in the morning, and in the afternoon we'll go down, brush it down, take all the stuff out of the limber, all the trash, you know, from the day. And but for the most part, they get cleaned just in the morning, and then we're in the cemetery all day after that. Every day when I come in and I come to work, I, I literally wake up in the morning and tell myself I am a tomb guard. Every day we have from 5 to 5.30, we'll come down, um, inspect the quarters. We will accept quarters. 6.30, new, the new soldiers in training are inspected. They come up, they have a minute to get from the back of quarters. Up to the front of quarters, set up their rack, and whoever is responsible, whoever is their, their trainer, will gig them or give them their corrections. And if they feel like their uniform is in good enough condition to walk, then they will be written in the schedule, and they will be allowed the opportunity to earn more walks to go outside. All right, you're making good improvement. Just need to work on the same uh, same spots, trouble areas, where the cracks are. You got your micrometer? Mm -hmm. So I like to see geeks fixed. Much better on the steam. It looks a lot more fresh, black. Yeah. Alright. <laughs> looking a little dull. I'm not a photogenic person. Measurements are money today, though. <laughs> a little more steam just on these, these press marks. Just a little more. Just go over it when you think you're done. Just go over it one more time. This four I'm gonna get All right. How is the little more steam right here? It's not, not bad. Though. You got a little 
little smudge on that wheel. See it there? Yeah. There's straps on this, it's kind of clean. Do you have the do you have the paint cut off where it is? Right, so right. You see that smudge? Did you put anything on this morning? Uh, yeah. I did. I blew magic. Right. I might have bumped that or something. Yeah. Just be careful when you're bringing it up here. Cool. I guess it was kind of cool. Keep bruising. The metal pieces are almost there. This looks a, little, a lot better today. Line six of the Sentinel's Creed is my standard will remain perfection. Now, every tomb guard understands that there is no such thing as perfection. And what that says is that we will constantly work harder every day. We will never settle. We will constantly work harder to be the best we could possibly be. When we're tired, when we're really hurting and our backs are hurting and our knees are hurting, we're still going to stand straight and we're still going to put forth the same amount of effort because of who we represent. We will always work and that's the little sacrifice that we have committed to make to honor those fallen soldiers and the unknown soldiers. Everybody, buddy, bird. Everybody, buddy, bird. Swinger, calm. Tony. Tony. Start tacking up at 6.30. We will bring the horses back out and out back. We'll hook them up to the wagon around 7.30, 7.45. And we'll try to roll out from here at about 8 o'clock. First funeral starts at 09. The second funeral will be at 11. The third funeral will be at 13. And the fourth will be at 1500. And then at the end of the last funeral, the 1500, we roll back here to the barn. We untack all the horses. And then we spend about two hours clean and tack. We usually get out of the barn around 5.30, 6 o'clock in the uh, afternoon. Rain, shine, hot, cold, we're out there doing it. Whoa! It's a 1903 Springfield. It's uh, about 10 and a half pounds, depending on weapon. We, uh, with our performance weapons, they're completely made out of wood, uh, except for the chrome parts. Uh, with our practice weapons, the ones that you'll be seeing a lot around here today, uh, we have black barrels and plastic uh, stocks, so if something happens and they break, they're a lot easier to replace. And the same with the bayonets. We don't chrome the bayonets on the practice weapons because if they do break, then you know we can just put another chrome bayonet on. And we use the tape here so the bayonets don't break. And uh, you know, just little things here and there. We put tape on certain parts of the weapon to kind of hold it together on the practice weapons. And with our wood weapons, we try to keep them as clean and neat as possible. But with the the job and, and hitting the weapon and doing the things that, that we do with the weapon, they kind of start to fall apart pretty fast. It's a real bayonet. Uh, we get them very sharp. They're actually made to fight with when we first get them and we have to dull them down. And we try to keep them dull. If you spin it fast enough, it doesn't matter how hard or dull it is, it, it still cuts you up pretty bad. All right, bring it in. That's, that's not the only problem, though. When we're going out into X and O's, the two and three men aren't getting where they, where they left at. I watched it, and uh, before we went out in X's O's, we were good. On the way back, you guys automatically condense it down. I don't know what it is. Make sure you're getting back to your spots so that we have that two full steps for the cluster. Cause... So keep that in mind. You want to keep it the same speed throughout the whole manual. Don't speed up just that one section, and in the circle, there's still two or three people that are leaving gaps.
Don't lose your head. We got those four mites more times for arch, just for dress. All right, so make sure you're paying attention, you know where you're at. Dress to the shoulders, but also pay attention to where you're at, at the, on the line panel. We have soloists, which obviously they do the solo routine. They're the lead trainers and everything related to the drill. We have the special, two specialties, which are the throwers and catchers for uh, the overhead rifle toss. Obviously, throwers throw it, catchers catch it. And uh, they also run the ends of the line. And uh, they, they typically lead training for the regular drillers. We call them RDs for short. Um, they, they do everything within the performance, but it's just the basic moves and manuals. And so the way we have it set up is the RDs will lead the newer guys, trying to teach them the drill, get better at their regular standards. The specialty will teach the RDs how to do the specialties job, and soloist teaches the specialty how to do the soloist job. You guys, this 21s are really, really shaky. You got to hit. Go into the 21, do your proper choo-choo, and tuck it and squeeze as hard as you can because you can tell some of you marking, marking time, it's like wobbling and you can see it really bad. And same thing with uh, the flare hand. Keep the flare hand up. Don't let it wobble around. We're our hardest critics and that's, that's what keeps us sharp. We have drills actually where uh, get the guys all stressed up in the middle of while they're running through the performance and that way if they can maintain composure and continue in the performance in a stressful environment then a little mistake in front of a crowd is nothing and they go on we teach them if you mess up you continue going on like like you were the only one that was right and everybody else was wrong We don't get a chance to come out of the cemetery. A lot of times we're in the cemetery, though, we have uh, tape and brushes that we can clean off. If, you know, horse slobbers on us or coated in white horse hair. two at the front of the wagon and then you've got swing or the second two and then wheel will be the two that are closest to the actual wagon itself. For me, um, what's running through my head from the time I leave the barn uh, is first, are my horses doing what they're supposed to do? Am I doing my job by making sure that they're doing their job? Secondly, is I gotta make sure that I and everybody else on my wagon looks good and is presentable for the family of the loved one that's being buried. Uh, so that's kind of what's going through my head the entire day. A, my horses, and B, am I uh, in a position where I look good enough that I'm doing justice to the person that is being buried? For us, when we go through the gates, we go through the uh, Arlington gates, the sunlight's always coming up right there and you can see it glaring off of that marble. Now, that's, that's one of my enjoyments. That's one of the things that fuel me through the day. Uh, sometimes you hear a lot, of, a lot of pain from others in there and, and it, uh, it does disturb you sometimes. But whenever you sit back and you look at Arlington as a whole, the place is beautiful. You know? So yeah, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't mind being here when I'm out. Before God changed it, it'd be, it'd be myself and whoever is, whoever is going to be replacing the soldier on the mat will be here in the ready room. Uh, 
whenever the time we're waiting on bells for the top of the hour or if it's bottom of the hour, we look at the clock. Hey, let me show you this time. Oh, I'm go. I'll leave from here ahead of the soldier that's, uh, that's getting replaced. I'll walk on to the plaza. I'll come all the way to center, salute the tomb, of course, make an announcement to the crowd of what's about to happen. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? I am Staff Sergeant Gillis of the 3rd Infantry Regiment, United States Army, Commander of the Relief, Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. The ceremony that you are about to witness is the changing of the guard. Salute the tomb again. I walk to the inspection block. And in the time that I walked up and made the announcement, the soldier that was down here, he, he would have left and he, he takes this spot in the ins inspection block. Uh, I take steps in front of him. I fully inspect the, the weapon, give it back to him. Inspect his uniform, uh, come around, inspect the back of his uniform. And then we'll go to center, as we call it, which is the center of the plaza. everyone together. They'll be at different arms. I bring the port arms. Hey! Reason! Oh! Face the tomb. We'll all salute the tomb. We'll face back and they'll pass on their orders. Hey! On your orders. Post and orders. Remain as direct. Orders. Acknowledge. Eddie. Hey. The soldier that's coming off, he would say, post and orders. Remain as directed. You know, just saying that, you know, just business as usual. You're going to stay here. You're going to go out the unknowns. The oncoming soldier will say, orders acknowledged, saying, I understand what's going on. We'll face the tomb again. We'll all salute. We'll face back. soldier that's coming off would be dismissed from duty, we'll fall out, and then we'll, we'll both leave the plaza. No pressure. No pressure. The reason why we do the challenges the way that we do them is because when you actually do get in a performance, those nerves are going to be doubled, tripled. You're going to be way worse than you were during your challenge. So we like to you know, give you a little taste of that, and then when you actually do get out on the drill floor, you, know, you, have, you have a little bit to work with, a little bit of experience. I will be testing to catch. Hopefully all goes well. The challenge is pretty much saying that you are better than one of the people in the performance, and therefore you could bring more to the performance by taking that person out. Try and build the guys up. Uh, everybody believes that they're the best at their job, and so winning a challenge is one step in proving that you are the best. They will throw you, obviously, you have to have your blouse on, sea belt, steel and a uh, sea cap and your catching glove. They'll throw eight shots. If you get six out of eight, then you pass. If you get eight out of eight, then you 
pass and you're automatically in the drill. Once you pass the catch test, then you got to challenge a catcher in the drill. And if you beat him, then you get the slot in the drill. It's, it's ruthless on the team. That's how you stay so proficient on the team. Basically, you have, uh, if your standards are slipping, you have some guy ready to step up and fill your spot the right way. So that's the way the drill team works right there. <laughs> Couple where you crept up on your two and three men. I don't know if you're trying to protect them or whatever, but when the shot's long, you gotta get back there. Um, I think the not the one and a half, but the one before was just like that. You yeah, caught it behind you. You're catching it with your back a lot. The overspun you didn't react to, right? Like, that was a low overspun, so you could have hit it cash, but if you're gonna hit it cash, yeah, then you have to hit it. Hit it. Um, not your best pass. It didn't catch you. Range from Humphrey gave you five at best, he gave you like three and a half. Yeah, so, you better next time. Just relax, you know what you're doing, just let it happen. It doesn't mean anything that you didn't oh, pass no. your first test. I didn't either. Take it again next Wednesday? Yeah, yeah, next Wednesday. You just need a week, train up, and then you can test again after a week. Uh, the test is pretty difficult. You have to react well. There's, you get six perfect shots that are thrown and you have to crush them with little to no movement once you hit the weapon. And then there's two that are just thrown as a surprise. And they can either be over-rotated or under-rotated depending on what the thrower throws at the time. So it, it all gets into the kind of what-if scenarios. In a performance, what if this happens? You have to be able to read the weapon almost instantly as soon as it releases their hands so you can react accordingly. Eagles are up, no fanfare. The history of fife and drum uh, really is one that it is crucial to the formation of the United States. It was the communication core of the Army. Uh, what was so interesting is, is in the 1700s you had no radios, you had no cell phones, no anything. So if you wanted to relay commands, you did it through the sounds of the fife, drum, and the bugle. Rehearsal is a very big part of it. Now, the Old Guard Fife and Drum Corps is, is the face of the Army. We're goodwill ambassadors as we travel, and that's who we represent, is the Army, is the United States. So in keeping with that tradition, we need to make sure that we exemplify what is the Army, which is precision. Which is our music up to the most high standards that you can possibly imagine. So rehearsal happens every day and beyond everyday performances and rehearsals, just like any full-time musician, it's up to you to go home and, and then hone your skill. When it's a, a passion, a passionate thing that you have to, to play your instrument, something easy, I, you want to go home to practice, you want to go home to better yourself. Does the drum part slow down during our four count turn to the back? It's not supposed to. It feels like it to me. Okay. Um, but still, just all the way through that. Okay. Um, then immediately following the interlude, tempo change, the leg lift. Uh, our initial mark time there. Boom, boom. Uh, not quite on. The troop stuff, that's kind of our, our signature. I think it's, it's the most impressive thing that we do. It's hard to describe without showing. What's so odd about the troop step is that you are playing at the same time, and you're then pointing your toe, dropping your toe, play at the same time, 
pick up the other foot, drop it, put it down, play, all of this at the same time. So it is truly like patting your head and rubbing your belly. Uh, and what makes it so difficult is at the same time of trying to make sure that you're in perfect phasing with everybody else, make sure that you're in perfect time. You also have to make sure that most obviously you're playing the correct music. So it's something that, that out of all the training takes a six month six months to train in the fife and drum for something that probably takes the longest music it involves coordination memorization and in focus Forward. we're all actually 11 charlies um indirect fire infantrymen uh mortarmen um by trade uh and that's because back in the uh 40s when they actually used these weapons it was actually an infantryman crew that was on these weapons uh, as direct fire weapons. That's how we came to be. Settle down. Settle down! We train daily, rigorously. Uh, that's that's what our job is. That's our job here. Um, you know, everything is perfect. There is no mistakes. There's no. There is no room for error. Uh, what we do here is 100%. You know, there's. There's no room for error. Lamp. 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 Battery. Oh. We have um, three sections. There's the uh, first and second section, which is the gun line, um, and that involves uh, the loaders, which load the rounds, uh, the 75 millimeter blank oh. rounds. Um, and then there's the gunner, which is responsible for uh, making sure they fire um, precisely with the, uh, the counter. Top! and the, uh, the watchman, and uh, you know, they go off, off his cue, and it's in, all in one instant, it's, it's a lot going on. Ceremonial at P. Then there's uh, the watch section, which uh, consists of the counter who keeps track of the rounds, the watchman who keeps time of the stopwatch, um, we do three, five, nine second missions, and um, then there's also the assistant watchman uh, who would make sure that the watchman is exactly on time. Um, because there's no room for error with that. Starting, you start on the gun line, and the first qualification you go as is loader. And that, and then comes backup loader, then followed by gunner, left-handed gunner, and backup gunner. Right now, I'm loader, backup loader, and right-handed gunner. There, once you're on the battery, um, you're at ceremonial at ease. Then a combo rep will come over, he'll give you, uh, give you a call sign, Quebec 1-4, and at that point you'll initiate ready battery. Ready, battery. And everyone snaps to pretty much parade rest. And then uh, from there it's settle down. Settle down. The gunner grabs the lanyard, loader grabs another round. Stand by, the one gun, the one gun gunner, he'll look at you, and then fire, uh, OIC will drop his hand, and he fight that one gun fires. And then from there it's on the watchman to call each gun at, at, the, at the specific interval from that point on. And then once that's done, uh, last round, the counter, he'll yell that out. Last round. Um, he calls that last round, he fires. They say staff ready cut. Um, down range, we render our you know, hand salute, and then we march off the battery. Order. Guns up now. Good. Forward. Force that staff. Hose on lead gun. One, two, three, four. Left. 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 Ready. Snap. Left. 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 Left.
You got this? Then a hole in that push and that's gonna get back to trouble. Right up into it. all of the harness from scratch and pattern for uh, case up. Yes. We actually maintaining six sets of complete tags. We got four for case that actually go out in the cemetery. We have one in training for of horses and one in training of soldiers. And uh, I would say they, they keep us pretty busy. Ninety percent of what we did before me going to class, we did by hand. I mean, everything was sewn with two needles and thread, and uh, it was very time-consuming. Uh, but it taught us a lot about the actual art itself. Now you see we use the machine. We can actually put out a nicer-looking product, and we can put out more. Did you take this apart? Ideally, it would take us probably about a week to 10 days to make one because it's going to three to four thickness of leather. And we're talking one stitch at a time. Hold for hold, you stitch it up. And uh, now we have the capabilities of putting maybe two to three of those together a day. Before the guys actually um, get on this machine, I like to teach them to trade first. They don't like it. They're probably a little uncomfortable over there now saying stitching, but it teaches them to trade. Tough, tough, tough level. Give me a drill and a bit. just my job to make sure that when they go out, they look the very best they can do. Well, right now, all we're doing is oiling the saddle. So yesterday, we put leather dye on, uh, let it soak in. It darkens the leather, gets it looking good and black again. And then today, we're, we wipe off the extra leather dye, whatever didn't soak into the saddle. And then we oil it, which the oil softens and helps preserve the leather as well as uh, makes it look a lot nicer and it'll help it shine later because at the end of the week what we'll do is we'll go back and we'll put the kiwi on it and then it will be ready to ride again. I grew up in Alabama uh, on a boarding farm. My parents have 500 horses that they take care of. That's what I grew up doing. I came up here looking to get away from horses <laughs> and uh, ended up in case on. So kind of backfired, but uh, it's something that I'm familiar with and something that I enjoy now. So um, I grew up riding western. Um, I grew up. I've I've done everything from rodeo to just riding around doing trail rides and stuff on the farm, exercising horses. And then I came up here, and you know I almost didn't pass the riding test for Kason, even though I've ridden horses my entire life. I almost didn't pass the riding test because it's completely different. I had to basically forget everything that I had known growing up and relearn how to do it here. One, two. Uh, we have to we have to put on a good presentation for the family. That's that's our main job. Uh, you know, we're doing a, a funeral for this family's loved one that passed away. And if they're going to be buried in Arlington Cemetery, then they deserve the respect. Two, 
Roger that. NCO Sergeant Parker actually when I was in training he told me because a big, a big part of it is nerves until you're confident out there you really can't put forth your best best performance and he told me a little trick that right when you put your glasses on you you should feel untouchable and that's kind of something that stuck with me so now when I, I literally that's like my on button I put my glasses on, my, on and I'm like all right here we go Transformation is complete. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? I am Specialist Brizel of the 3rd Infantry Regiment, United States Army. Guard of Honor, Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. My dedication to the sacred duty is total and wholehearted. And the responsibility bestowed on me never will I falter. And with dignity and perseverance, my standard will remain perfection. Through the years of diligence and praise and the discomfort of the elements, I will walk my tour in humble reverence to the best of my ability. It is he who commands the respect I protect, his bravery that made us so proud. Surrounded by well-meaning crowds by day, alone in the thoughtful peace of night, this soldier will in honored glory rest under my eternal vigilance. When they come back, they're actually more uh, more relaxed. You know, after a good day's work, they're pretty tired. They just want to go back into their stall and eat some hay. Uh, but 
before they go back in, since it's been really hot out recently, we've been uh, actually spraying them down before we put them back, which they seem to enjoy a lot more than when you do it early in the morning, you know. But anyway, who likes that wake up call? And when you get in the military, you understand tra tradition is, is one of the biggest drivers. If you, uh, if you uh, follow it, it's one of the big things. But other than that, whenever you know that you've done your job and you know that it's represented the U.S. Army and you've completed your mission, which is to serve as a mounted escort to our fallen soldiers, that alone gives you a good smile at the end of the day. Uh, we're going to do this real quick. Battery. I'm looking at everything from uh, lint to measurements to uh, your brass being polished um, to everything just being where it's supposed to be at. Um, everything's done down to like a millimeter. And if you're about two millimeters off, it's pretty much a reinspection. And you got to, you know, whenever that's designated, you got to be there. And, Hopefully you don't have another reinspection because then it's some push-ups. Hey, yeah. Hey, nope. Okay. Battery, ah, uh, change. Pop. Oh. the far trellis to me, CH. Steady. Lock the near, unlock the far trellis away, CH. Lock the far, unlock the near, trellis away, CH. Downhill be easy. Steady. the guns daily um, and they constantly being resurfaced we, we put a lot of time and effort and pride into the guns and uh, that's that's a big part of what we do because they're so old uh, on the average day we'll probably spend about maybe about four to five hours just cleaning them um, shining them up polishing whatever needs to be polished and everything like that and then includes once we do get them where they're going they still get cleaned once we get there uh, the, the, the metal gets you know sanded down over and over again to give it that shine. Yeah, we're, ne we're never seen, but we're always heard, so. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the United States Army Old Guard Fife and Drum Corps. watch our performance, I think 
we are so unique it's not something that you see anywhere if they see us play sparks the true patriotism that happened in seventeen seventy six ladies and gentlemen the united states army drill team That's one of the things that sets us apart from the rest of the uh, uh, ceremonial drill teams that the armed forces have. Uh, we actually put a little bit of what we call flair in the drill, and it gives the audience a chance to get involved with us and stuff like that. Like on the ends of the lines, we'll step out and like wave or fix our tie or something like that. But it gives the crowd a little bit of humor and takes away from the so serious part of the drill team. It lets us know that we're still human. In addition to the soldiers on the field before you, the Presidential Salute Battery is led by Staff Sergeant Des Lindsay from Baltimore, Maryland. It's, uh, it's just an honor and a privilege to be here, and uh, I love what we do, and uh, I, I couldn't imagine myself anywhere else. When a soldier enjoys his work, then he will do it to the you know, absolute best of his ability. Um, and the, the training that, that, uh, that we put these soldiers through here makes them even better as far as, like we were talking about before, as far as the, the precision and the exactness of, of, of how they do it.